disproving arrows and and get to the bottom of stuff. We weren't trying to go out and and spook each other out and and try to convince each other that it's that it's real. I mean, I, I know it's real. I had very intense experiences ever since I was fifteen. Like, I don't need to have an experience. I need to comfort these people. In order to do that, I need knowledge. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we're being asked, um, I guess people, everyone's, you know, huge fans of yours, of course, and so they've always been following you. Um, but they're bringing up that um, they remember something about a, they believe it was a bar that tried to set you guys up and fake things or a family <laughs> or something. Yeah, so um, there's a little bit more to that story. This is uh, was a Moss Beach Distillery, I think, yeah, in California. Um when we went in there, uh, you know, we went in there and we, we did the tour. And as we were kind of taking the tour, there was this vague recollection of, uh, of the thought of a rumor about a place that, in, you know, had trickery going on. But it was just kind of a gag thing and was somewhat known. Uh, but it, it wasn't sure if it was real or not. And so it was just kind of bouncing around in the back of our heads. And after the tour, we're like is this that place? But the guy was, as he's, the guy who gave us the tour was like the head chef. He wasn't the owner or anything. And, and he, he didn't mention anything. And we said, is anything rigged or anything here? You know, is any, anything not working that you know of? And he's like, well, not that I know of. And he's kind of weird about it. And so we're doing the case and we find everything and we fix it. And we, every half the gags were broken. So we fixed them. Uh, we're like, we'll get this place on it eventually, you know, we'll get there. Uh, but, uh, come to find out, uh, you know, at, on the way to, re- to the reveal, because so much of it was fake, Jay was not happy and not excited for the reveal. And I remember him looking at me, um, from the driver's seat, cause apparently I don't ever drive, but, uh, uh and he goes, he goes, Hey, gee, who I said. You're going to have to do the talking on this one. <laughs> I go, uh, that's my Jay impression. And uh, I go, we go there and we talked and stuff. And it, it was weird because when you're watching the show, you don't really know who this guy is. And then when he's doing the reveal, he's got this kind of smirk on his face. And everyone was just so mad at him. And I had to watch the episode to see why. And I was like, okay, yeah, he looks like he looks like he's guilty the whole time. Uh, come to find out, like I said, he was the head chef, and the owner had told him specifically not to mention this stuff. And as we're sitting there in the reveal saying, hey, we found all this fake stuff that you didn't tell us about, he was coming to the realization that he was thrown under the bus. And so that was his reaction during the the, the review. If you watch it, you'll see it. And everyone <laughs> killed the guy, and we're like – I was trying to make peace. I'm like, you don't understand. Like, he's a nice guy. He's just trying to keep his job. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it bothered me because, like, I thought it was fun. It was like a paranormal boot camp, you know? Like, see what you can find, and it was all there, and it was very easy to fix and stuff. And and uh, but I was sad because you know, if there's real paranormal activity there, they're hiding it behind these gags and, and so you'll never see it. And we never got a chance to really experience it because we were too busy fixing the place. All right. Well, I think that's hilarious that you're like fixing their haunted <laughs> victory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was up in the attic. They had this uh, like pneumatic system to move the chandeliers. And I get up and I'm like, this is all broken. And I fixed it. <laughs> tested it. It was working. And Jay fixed the, the face in the mirror and all that. And, and we fixed it. So that when you open the bathroom door, it laughs and, <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> oh my goodness well you know that that's another thing that you know i think drew everyone to you guys is that you know you guys are good sports and you know you were just fun to watch so that's you know that's good yeah <laughs> so we have um a couple questions for you um sure we know that and not all of them are paranormal, but um, we know that you love Star Wars. Yes. <laughs> and you have been asked what your favorite Star Wars movie is. Oh, what is my favorite? Star- Jeez, that's like, what's your favorite child? <laughs> uh, well, 
Okay, well, let's do it this way. I don't like any, I don't like any of the prequels. The one that causes the least amount of troubles. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I don't like any of the prequels. No thanks. Uh, I don't like one, two, and three. I pretend they don't exist. Uh, but of the original three, Empire Strikes Back was my favorite. But um, of the new stuff, uh, Rogue One is was fantastic and just brilliantly woven. Um, but I love them all. Come on. Except for the prequels. I don't know. Well, unfortunately, you're going to lose Becky on the Star Wars thing. Cause she's not a big fan of that. <laughs> seen them all, but yeah, I'm. I know, and everyone I know is like huge into it, but that's not one of my big things. So what's that's what's right. what's one of your passions when it comes to movies? Like, what kind of stuff do you like? I am a huge Disney freak, so I like like the Disney animated stuff. Yeah, I am too. I mean, we got the my wife and I have the DVC. We go. I think we're going twice this year. We, I love that stuff. When I was a kid, I've been drawing ever since I could hold a pencil. And when I was a kid, I wanted so bad to work for Disney. I wanted to be an animator for them. Um, and then I realized uh, the amount of effort that goes in animation versus the amount of pay you get. And I was like, mm, maybe not. <laughs> especially disney you have to be like a virtuoso like you have to be able to do oil paintings and stuff if you want to be even an animator um and but uh yeah i i turned into a kid there i love disney my favorite animated disney movie of all time it's it's gonna sound weird but pinocchio i love that movie oh very cool yeah what about you your favorite uh my favorite is beauty and the beast oh yeah yeah well there you go what do you think new one I loved the movie, actually. I love that they gave more of a background to the storyline the, the animated did. Yeah, I love how we learned more about the uh, the sorceress, the woman. Right. That, came. that was really neat. And her father. Yeah, I, I, I loved, you know, all of that. That was like, I, I couldn't wait to see that. But yeah, I'm a huge Disney fan. And, you know, it's it's funny because I follow you on, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. And I remember there's been a couple times that you've gone to Disneyland and I miss you by like one week. And I'm oh, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. like, I always have to miss Grant. He's there and I'm there like after or before <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> well, but aren't you closer to Walt Disney World, though? Yeah, I, I actually like the Magic Kingdom at Disneyland better than the one at Disney World. But all this is... It's all going to change by 2021. It's all going to be radically different. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we it's easier for us to get to Disney uh, World just because there's more places to stay with the DVC than D- Disneyland only has one. Right. So it's hard to get in there. Um, but, uh, I, don't, I mean, once my once my feet hit Disney soil, I just turn into a kid and I just love it no matter where I am. We, we were able to go to Disneyland uh, Paris a oh, couple of years ago. That was wild, yeah. Yeah, I've only been to Disney World once, and we usually go to Disneyland because the fact that we're in Arizona, it's just yeah. a drive, you know, so it's not a big deal for us to go there. We actually went to Disneyland twice this past, or in 2017, so that was really cool. Nice. Still not enough. Yeah, it's a lot <laughs> of fun. We're being asked if you like Halloween time at Disney. Have you been there at Halloween time? Uh, I have my wife's been to she's got when her best friend lives in California right near Disneyland and and so she she went out there to visit her and they were able to go uh, to Halloween out there and see the nightmare before Christmas at the Haunted Mansion and all that um, I've been to Disney World during Halloween and it's tons of fun Uh, but uh, I I guess they're going to get the they're going to get the nightmare before Christmas overlay at Haunted Mansion there too. Uh, yeah, I love it. Come on. <laughs> How can you not? It's Disney. It's fun. <laughs> it's so good. My favorite. Okay, well, I could talk about Disney all the time, but we'll move on because there's a Same, I could do. <laughs> I can just talk to you for the rest of the night about Disney. I really could. But well, um, Star Wars, so it all overlaps. It's all good. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now she's got to like it because it's all the same. <laughs> Um, so I also know that you do the board games, 
the rather dashing board games. Yes. And we had a question about that asking, where do you get inspiration for creating a unique board games when there's already so many that exist out there? Yeah, and that is the truth. Like everyone's familiar with like Monopoly and Parcheesi, and, but you get past that, like you look outside of Target and Walmart and stuff, and holy moly, there are thousands of amazing games with beautiful artwork and brilliant mechanics and story. It really is a renaissance in the game world. Um, I work intensely with my friend Mike Ritchie, who is a game designer and who's been doing it for over a decade, and, and he's very talented. Um, so he usually comes up with a majority of the game. Like, he's the designer. He'll come to me with cut-out pieces of paper and math and all this stuff, and and my job is a, a developer and art director. So I have to take this and figure out what does it feel like we're actually doing and try to, to put a theme and a feel to it, um, you know, uh, he'll just have bits and stuff and, and maybe a, a hint of where it should go. And, and I have to say, OK, yeah, this is a game about dwarves or blowing up planets or whatever it is. Um, and then I work with him closely and we play it and play and play it and refine it and beat it up and, and try to break it. And, and we do that. So our inspirations come sometimes they're mechanic based. So we come up with a mechanic and go. This is new. This is neat. How do? What does this? What does this feel like? How? What is the world? What is the real world application for this? Um, and sometimes it's the other way around. We're like, boy, it'd be cool to make a game about, like, one of our games coming. Uh, you know, it'd be cool to take the RP, the role playing game experience of D and D, and boil it down to a thirty minute hour long card game. And that's what we did. And that game's coming out in March. So. You know, some you can get inspired with that. Mike's uh, he's like a maestro. He's he thinks the way about board games like I do about music. Like I have a bunch of riffs in my head, and I can make songs out of them, or I mash them together and make songs. And that's what he does all the time. I mean, my wife was was learning about essential oils, and we were talking about his ability to make games. I'm like, yeah, he could probably make a game about essential oils, and within an hour, he had a game going about it it's like geez man calm down <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's tough i mean you have to you have to really keep your finger on the pulse in the industry and and we're well known in the industry and we know a lot of people in the industry and and uh you know you start coming up with an idea and then you look at what's coming out and what the rumors you hear and you're like okay well we can't do that we have to change it this way and uh, fortunately the the world of hobby games is very uh, open-minded. So you can come up with the craziest, like there's a game called Exploding Kitten, Exploding Kittens. Or there's another game called, yeah, it's like, there's a game about anything and everything. And the kind of kookier it is, the more they ex are excited about it. So whatever. Right. I, I don't know though. Some of those games might be scary. <laughs> Yeah, some of them are really messed up, you know. <laughs> but we, we give a lot of advice to other uh, game designers and other companies in the industry. They like to put stuff in front of us because um, Mike and I are very good at breaking games or finding the, the perfect situation for it. Like um, one game came to us and it was uh, one person, you know, put a game in front of us and the concept um, – the concept was very controversial. It was about like trading slaves and stuff. And we're like, what is going on? And so uh, we had them change it to like a spice road kind of thing, <laughs> trading goods instead of people. And it's like, it's weird. <laughs> uh, we're being asked if any of the games that you're creating will ever be available online. Oh, they're all available online. Yep. You can go to Amazon and get any of our games. Uh, you can go to – we prefer you go to – if you have a, a local game store, if you buy our game through them, it helps us and them. It helps the whole industry. Um, you know. But, hey, if it's more convenient to get them on Amazon, save a few bucks, that's fine. Um, but you can also get them directly through our website, ratherdashinggames.com. Yeah. Well, there's another question also, and it's, I guess it's uh, will they be moving to online multiplayer? Online multiplayer? Yeah. Uh, 
No plans of that yet. Our multiplayer is around the table. That's the kind of way we like it. But um, uh, there is something called um, – oh, my gosh. 